Okay, so here we are. Uh, the title of this talk is How an Ultrasound Master Lightens Her Load. And I will preface this by saying I won't be talking about some of the core applications of ultrasound that actually help lead you to life-saving treatments for life-threatening diagnoses like dissection and triple A's, ruptured ectopics, but I will be talking about some techniques that I use on a daily basis to make me a more efficient ED doc and to help uh, improve patient care. So I'm gonna go through cases. I will go over some time-saving nerve blocks and I will go over my ultrasound approach for traumatic eye injuries. So time-saving blocks, here's the first case. This is a 50-year-old man with an erection for about 20 hours after using Trimix. On the right is the Salesforce building in San Francisco, and so it's, it's to me a fallacy on a daily basis that I have to drive by. Um, Trimix is one of the injectable combo meds for erectile dysfunction that commonly gets used uh, recreationally, especially in San Francisco. You see the patient, the patient has priapism. The patient ends up needing a cavernal soul aspiration. You're thinking about what block you can do. Case number two is a patient I saw in triage. I know a lot of us are practicing triage medicine right now. Our EDs are overcrowded. So this, is, this was a 36-year-old man with a one day of penile pain and difficulty urinating. And this, these symptoms were preceded by right flank pain for about a week. And so he came in with that. You can see there's something in his penile urethra. I thought, why not? I'll try to do this in triage. I think I can do this. So I ultrasounded his penis, which lends itself very well to ultrasound. You can see dilated penile urethra proximal to this object, which really looks like a stone. Here's a cross-sectional view of his penis. You can see the cavernosum and the spongiosum very well. Once again, you can see the dilated urethra. And then taking a look at his kidney, you can see he has some right hydro. So this all tracks. He had a kidney stone that is stuck in his penile urethra and he uh, currently has a distended bladder and some urinary output issues. So we're gonna talk about the dorsal penile nerve block. And many of us do this blindly, but how nice will it be to actually see what you're doing, use less anesthetic. Uh, and this is the, the go-to block for any penile emergency. So you're gonna place the probe on the dorsal side of the penis and you're gonna be, you know, blindly we think about going 10 and two, but with the ultrasound probe, you can get even closer to the nerve. The nerve lies just lateral to the blood vessels. Once you're in with your needle, you're gonna dissect, uh, you're gonna dissect uh, fluid away underneath Buck's fascia. So you're just getting right underneath that fascial plane, putting three cc's in each side. So this is the gentleman with the stone. I'm in triage trying to be helpful, get people out of the waiting room. I think I can probably do this. You can see me getting right underneath that fascial plane and I'm starting to hydro dissect. So for both patients, I did a ultrasound guided penile nerve block. We were able to aspirate that first patient. The second patient, I can't lie, I definitely needed some help in getting that stone out. I had to get urology to help me out because it was a ginormous stone and this thing was like over two centimeters. I don't know how it got that far without him needing to come to the ED until then. But I do feel like this helps uh, reduce patient's pain and really is your go-to block for any penile, any penile complaint. So penile trauma, phimosis, paraphimosis, priapism aspiration, you're gonna use this block. And um, I was able to take care of that patient in the waiting, uh, from the waiting room. Hand cases, these are the next few cases. I hope that you take away, honestly, besides the posterior tibial nerve block, the, these, these blocks are so, so helpful for hand emergencies. This was a 13-year-old who came in after a firecracker accident, and so his, his thumb and his uh, index finger are off. He also has some third-degree burns to the palmar aspect of his hand. And so thinking about, one, if you're in a place where you need to transport this patient, how you're gonna get their pain under control, and how you're gonna get their pain under control immediately and also for transport. Uh, this was a 35-year-old gentleman who was a roofer who tripped and fell into the tar. And um, just a side note, you can use mayonnaise to try to help get tar off. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a nice little trick. So in thinking about how we're gonna get this person's pain under control and also get him to the burn center. Forearm nerve blocks are your friend. You should use them often, especially if the majority of the hand is involved. Remember our ulnar, radial, and ulnar dis and median uh, distributions in the hand. And you remember earlier I mentioned, if you're going to block something, 
you have to go one joint above. And so in order to block the hand, we're gonna to need to interface with those nerves at the forearm. So this is our approach for the forearm nerve blocks. I'm gonna come in in plane, and it's quite beautiful because literally within 10 minutes, you can have the entire hand numb for someone with one of those awful hand catastrophes. And this is what it's gonna look like. Your ulnar nerve is ulnar to your ulnar artery. Your radial nerve is radial to your radial artery. And your beautiful median nerve is sitting there right in the center without any uh, vessels surrounding it. So it's a very easy target. I think that this is one of the most time-saving blocks because with any of those injuries I just mentioned, especially those burns, there's no way you're gonna control that person's pain adequately with opiates, especially if they're gonna to have to get transported to another facility for uh, definitive treatment. So forearm nerve blocks, think about them for painful hand catastrophes. Okay, here's another case. Now you've already seen this, but this is my go-to for the sole of the foot and it honestly saves so much time. So we have the gentleman with the lack from the, the shard of glass, the gentleman who stepped on the rake and had the rake in his, in his foot. And honestly, posterior tibial nerve blocks will save you time. If, if you're doubting it or you use a different method, I would encourage you to just try it on your next shift when you're encountering pathology in the sole of the foot. Remember our anatomy here, the tibial nerve is just above the flexor hallucis longus. You can see the vascular bundle above that. And we're gonna use an in-plane technique for this. So posterior tibial nerve blocks helped us to sew up that patient's foot and also helped us to get that rake out of the other gentleman's foot and provide wound care. My go-to block for the sole of the foot. The last thing I'll talk about is ocular trauma. How many of us take care of patients who have dealt with ocular trauma and their eyelids are so swollen, we can't do an eye exam? Now, back in the day, or maybe currently, if people still do this, this is how you would pry open someone's eye. And if I was that patient, I definitely wouldn't want you coming to me with paper clips trying to pry open my eye. There is a different way that is more sensitive to the patient and allows you to evaluate much more than just pupil reaction and eye movement. And that's using the ultrasound. You know you can use the ultrasound to do a pupil pupillary exam, meaning you can look at the pupil and actually determine whether or not it's reactive to light. You can do this ultrasound even when someone has limited range of motion with their extraocular movements. So you can see the eye is tilted in a, a specific direction here, but we can also appreciate that that pupil is reactive. So how do you do this? Well, you have your patient. You're gonna place the ultrasound probe right on their eye and you're gonna tilt and ask them to look down. That's gonna bring the pupil into view. Next, you're gonna use their unaffected eye and you're gonna shine the light in their unaffected eye. And if they have a reflex consensually, you'll be able to see that. And it's quite nice and it's much easier than prying open someone's eye. Patients appreciate this more. In addition, you can look at their extraocular uh, movements with the ultrasound as well. So with the ultrasound and a transverse orientation, you can look at medial lateral movements. You then can go ahead and rotate your probe in a long axis ask the patient to look up and down. On the ultrasound machine, it's going to look the same, but you're evaluating all four axes of extraocular movements. And so you get the same information that you would have wanted in someone with a huge, swollen, traumatic eyelid. While you're looking at the eye, you can also catch certain eye pathologies. First one being this toothpick sign, you see that purple area that I've highlighted, the posterior aspect of that eye, that's a retrobulbar hematoma. You may be able to catch that on ultrasound while you're doing this exam. You may also be able to determine whether or not someone has a ruptured globe. This is that same patient that blew off his hand. He also uh, had eye trauma. So that's that 13 year old. You can see that there, there is complete collapse of the anterior uh, chamber, and you can also see that there's air within the, within the globe as, as a, in addition to a lot of blood in that globe. So that globe is completely ruptured. Lastly, you can also detect retinal detachments. I think that people are hesitant to use ultrasound for ocular trauma, and I would say if you're going to pry someone's eye open, you're putting quite a bit of pressure. So think about ultrasound for ocular trauma. You can get a pupil exam, your extraocular movements, and you may also be able to see certain eye pathology. 
So those are my, these are my take home points. Think about your time saving blocks, the dorsal penile block, forearm blocks, the posterior tibial nerve block, and think about grabbing your ultrasound the next time you're dealing with ocular trauma. You can look at extraocular movements and the pupillary exam, and in addition to traumatic eye injuries. Thank you so much.